Welcome to the Grim Leftovers Show with Grimnir every Monday night at 7 p.m. Eastern on reallibertymedia.com and rlmradio.xyz. Alrighty, folks, it is Monday, June 3rd, 2019. This is the Grim Leftovers program, as comes to you every single Monday night at 7 p.m. Eastern. This is episode 25, for those of you keeping track of such things, and those of you that are not, it's still episode 25. (laughs) Anyway, I'd like to say hi and howdy to everybody, and thank you all for tuning in that are out there in the various places. Whether you're on freedomsnetwork.com, reallibertymedia.com, rlmradio.xyz, realliberty.org, uh, minds.com. If you saw the notification on Twitter, welcome to you all as well. And come on over, jump on into the chat here on reallibertymedia.com, and you'll be joined by all the wonderful folks that are here today. We got the Beatle and, uh, and DC and Anti and Asbo. Chow Sadoni, Graham Z, Mr. Don C, uh, Java Doctor and Meister Brow and Miss Kate Rob Works, Romes, Vanna White and Weather Dork Bots. We got Miss Beth Z. Hey, Beth, I, I thought you'd been missing there for a little bit. Uh, we got Phantom and Circle and Cyborg Noodle. We got Dakota and Frumpy and Gooberzilla. And huh? Yeah, huh? Uh, and JJ's and Kiss and. Rufka three in the smart as smart ass spot. Yes indeed. We got all kinds of folks over here in the chat and we got more folks out there tuning in uh that are not here in the chat as yet anyway. Uh before I get started though, however, I, w- I would like to <laughs> I would like to uh respond to a, a response to a tweet that I tweeted out. Uh, I tweeted out earlier today, uh, there was a, a article posted that the Congressional Funding Bill protects cannabis banking uh, and uh, lets D.C. legalize weed, which, whatever, I don't really care about D.C. one way or the other. The other part, however, that it protects cannabis banking. That would be nationwide. And so I, I wrote in there, forgetting the D.C. part, this could be huge, which I... I do believe it could be huge because one of the biggest drawbacks right now uh, in the cannabis industry, cannabis, weed, whatever you want to call it, industry, is the fact that they can't just go and deposit the money from their their, their services into a bank and, and, and do business in the way most other normal businesses can do. Anyway, Hal Anthony, Mr. Behind the Woodshed himself, responded to my tweet and said... I would have thought you would have given this a grim finger explaining it was more status gummickry and why not just delist and non-criminalize cannabis given allowing the bank, the banking agrees to use. So what's the point of further monkey business? No? Yes, Hal. Abso-freaking-lutely. I want... Uh, marijuana to be freed, uh, pot, cannabis, whatever you want to call it, to be freed from all regulations and uh, other such things as that. But I, being is the way that it is now, I want those businesses to be able to operate in a normal way so that they can profit and grow and expand. Uh, to get to the next step in that in that evolution, I don't know what that's going to take. So, yes, I do not want any status fingers touching those industries, but they are, and they will continue to do so for some period of time. So, at, at this point in time, um, I, I if, if they, I don't know, they were supposed to talk about this bill today at some point. I don't know if they've done that or, yet or not. Uh, but, uh, so, you know, it, it's just... It, to get to get things on a level playing field and allow the marijuana businesses, cannabis businesses to operate as at least at that minimal level. Let them put their money into banks if they want to. I'm not saying they should or they have to, obviously, but uh, it would certainly help out things a lot as far as the growth potential 
of the cannabis industry. So that's all about that. I, I just wanted to bring that up because of course, of course, I want everything to be unstatusized as much as possible, wherever possible. But uh, at, at this point in time, we still got to deal with them assholes. So, yeah, yeah, till then, till then. <laughs> hey, I see Moose Girl has joined back with us in Vin A. So, uh, welcome to you two as well here on the Grim Leftovers program. And uh, let's get on to some of the stories we got lined up for ya. Because we do have a bunch of stories lined up here for you. And uh, they're not all brand new stories, of course. They're not supposed to be. It is the Leftovers program. So uh, let me let me throw a quick now there in the chat. In case some, you know, those new people that just joined uh, are, are unaware that here are I. Here are I. <laughs> all right, all right. <laughs> here it is. So this first article is from April 26th. Uh, new York County's conducting mass vaccination drills. That can't be good. <laughs> this is uh, posted up here on, uh, what, what's the name of this website? Uh, healthnutnews.com. Healthnutnews.com by Aaron Elizabeth. So uh, here it is. It says, very often we find stories like this that have largely gone unnoticed and we know we have to share them with you. Part of the reason they go unnoticed is that the media, the clap, corporate lame ass propaganda, does not want to call attention to these. Uh, let, you know, people start wondering, worrying about them. So uh, we don't want that to happen. About the government overreach that, that and, and maybe they'll go out and protest because they don't want mandatory vaccinations. So the local news covers the story, but make sure it's not too flashy, not too flash somebody. And it's all about normalizing these things, putting them right under your nose, hoping you are too sleepy to even notice until it's too late. And what's been happening in counties all over New York since the beginning of April, uh, health officials there pretending that this is a public health disaster and they run a mass vaccination drill. On April 4th in Seneca County, Health Department wanted, wanted 50 to 100, quote, volunteers to serve as clinic patients, actors, for a max, mass vaccination exercise in order to show that in the event of an emergency, as they declare it, the county could protect the health of local residents. Yeah, vaccinations are really going to protect your health. You can bet on that because, well, the government said so. <laughs> On April 10th, health officials in Steuben County were looking for volunteers for a public health preparedness drill at Haverling High School, simulating mass exposure to a virus that required a vaccine. Oh, how about the other way around? How about simulating mass exposure to a vaccine that required another vaccine? <laughs> at least 150 people were needed. Uh, today, or whenever this article was published, uh, Lewis County Public Health is hosting an emergency vaccination drill to discern how well the county could respond. Bonus, each time a volunteer goes through the line, they will be entered to win gift cards. Woohoo! <laughs> uh, Kate is asking, is this girl not married to Mike Adams? I have no idea from Natural News. Yeah, I... I, I, I I could not answer that question. Um, Niagara County Health Department officials are looking for around 800 volunteers to participate in their max, mass vaccination drill on the day this was published. Yeah. So, um, I, I, there, there apparently was a video embedded here, but that video is now missing in action. So, I... I I, I don't know what the deal is with that, but uh, 
Yeah, so there, there's that article. I, I don't know. Um, is her name? Her name's not Adams, right? No, her name is uh, Aaron Elizabeth. I, 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 I don't keep up on who's married to who, but um, maybe, probably, if you, if you've heard that, then I, I guess that could be a, a certain possibility. Uh, anyway, so uh, yeah, they, they're trying to uh, push the mass vaccinations mass mandatory forced vaccinations because their vaccinations made people sick and, and caused those people to spread diseases. But they're not going to tell you that part, of course. All they're going to tell you is that, oh, yeah, we got a problem here. You better take our injection. All right, <laughs> moving on. Oh, boy. Antiwar.com from April 29th here by Jason Ditz. Uh, Pompeo says helping Saudis attack Yemen is in America's best interest. Really? <laughs> oh, okay. So Kate says, no, it's, she's married to Dr. Mercola. Okay, cool. Well, I, I like Dr. Mercola for far better than I like Mike Adams. So, meh, for what it's worth. Um, <laughs> yay, Doc. All right. <laughs> All right. Um, so they blame the entirety of the Yemen war on Iran. <laughs> okay, with, with the Senate planning uh, that week of April 29th, to process President Trump's veto of the War Powers Act challenge to the Yemen war, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo took the reins to defend U.S. involvement in the massive bloodshed going on in Yemen via Saudi Arabia using American bombs, of course, saying that it was in America's best interest. Pompeo's argument centered on the idea that the United States was obliged to help Saudi Arabia defend itself from retaliatory fights, meaning once Saudi Arabia goes over there and bombs the crap out of Yemen, if Yemen sticks up its hand to defend itself, that is, that is a retaliatory fight, meaning to try and block a punch coming at your face or a bomb coming at your house, um, if you try to stop that in any way, you are the aggressor suddenly. Yeah, that's the way they look at it. Now that the Saudis had launched a war and provoked that retaliation, on top of that poor argument for an obligation, Pompeo relied on what the administration seems to have believed is the most compelling argument, even if it's kind of based 100% based on a lie. He argued that the whole war was Iran's fault. Not intervening would make Iran happy. What? Uh, logic is absolutely lacking in these, from these, these things. But I suppose most people read it and just buy whatever the headline is without actually looking any further that, that somehow uh, when one country attacks another, if that country is part of the uh, NATO or the U.S. ally or uh, anybody the United States kind of gets along with, whether it's whether they really get along with them or they just do business with them, uh, it, it, it's kind of the, the deal there that those people are okay and if they attack somebody, that's perfectly fine. But if that person they attacked uh, tries to stop them or fights back, actually fights back, then they are evil. They are terrible. They are horrible, terroristic folk. Anyway, that was the argument Saudi Arabia successfully used to sucker the U.S. into the war. Um, yeah, I don't even think they needed that. They Saudi Arabia could have just said, hey, we'll give you five cents off a barrel of gas, uh, I mean a barrel of oil. Come help us out. Or maybe not even that much. It doesn't really take much. Anyway, though, to be fair, no effort was required. I Iran never more than ha never had more than tentative links 
to the Shiite Houthi, Houthi movement and that they're never even the same type of Shiites uh, was, was lost on the administration. Yeah. Oh, you mean those are they, those two type of Shiites don't even get along with each other? All right. Pompeo's argument is effectively that the United States has blundered so deeply into this foolish war. I don't even know how you call it a war. It's not like Yemen's got a real way to fight back. It's not a war. It's a slaughter. But uh, reading as the article says, the foolish war, they have been plugging away. And to the extent they can fool themselves into somehow sticking to sticking it to Iran, they uh, might feel a little better about all the harm they're doing in Yemen. I, I certainly feel no better about it. And hopefully if you've been actually paying attention and not just reading these nonsensical governmental statist headlines, uh, you understand that this is a slaughter that's going on. It's not a war. And, and, if, and if you attack somebody that's attacking you, you retaliate against that person that's attacking you, you're not attacking them. You're, you're trying to just stop them from going after you. It's crazy. All right. From one of those aforementioned clap outlets comes this article on April 19th, posted by Karen Shedd. CNBC.com. America's favorite fruit could go extinct. What is your favorite fruit, folks? I don't know if bananas are my favorite fruit, but I really like bananas. This article is about bananas. Not free bananas, as some of you may be uh, familiar with. <laughs> but just bananas in general. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> In the 19th century, a few pioneering entrepreneurs set out to make tropical fruit for the most popular in the U.S. Uh, they succeeded, and the banana is still Americans' favorite fruit. In the last decade, the United States imported an average of 2.2 billion worth of bananas every year, largely from Central and South America. Yeah. Most of this business is done by three major companies, Chiquita, uh, Del Monte, and Dole. Who's, who's, who's bopping me over here? Oh, it's just Twitter. Never mind. Okay. But their business and America's eating habit, habits are under threat as bananas face existential crisis. Since the mid-1980s, a deadly fungus has spread from Southeast Asia to Australia, the Middle East, and Africa. It causes Panama disease, which can wipe out entire plantations of bananas. There's a video uh, here involved, or at least it was. Oh yeah, there is still a video involved. Um, to learn about Panama disease, as well as uh, Chiquita's predecessor, United Fruit, and how they slave I mean, uh, industrialized of the banana industry. So, uh, yeah. I like bananas. I don't want them to go extinct. All right, since we're on fruit, we'll cover this one. Slightly out of order, that's all right. <laughs> this is posted on Get Holistic Health. It says, what? That's not, that's not the article date, that's just the website date. Uh, I don't know. I think they have an article date here, but it must have been around that time in April, late April, early early May, maybe. Um, all right, yeah. I don't know why, but the article doesn't have an, an actual date on it. Uh, GetHolisticHealth.com, and it's called Five Major Orange Juice Brands found to be laced with cancer-linked Monsanto chemical. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, 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 like, I like orange juice. It's good stuff. I don't drink it every day, but, you know, I do like orange juice. 
Free bananas, 20% off. Wait, if they're free, how do you get 20% off? Anyway, <laughs> what's 20% of zero? All right, as far as healthy drinks go, few are more popular in the United States than a glass of orange juice with breakfast. The average American, American consumes 2.7 gallons of OJ every year, and about two-thirds of the limited-service restaurants Limited service restaurants are not all restaurants limited service. Uh, uh, anyway, offer it as a beverage choice. When properly made, especially fresh squeezed and organic, orange juice can be extraordinarily healthy for a wide variety of reasons. It's rich in vitamin C, fiber, contains antioxidants to help protect and nourish the skin, among, among many other benefits. But if you drink OJ in the U.S., you may getting be you may be getting far more than you bargained for. A surprisingly high dose of one of the most controversial chemicals in the world. It happens to be linked to cancer, and it also serves as the main ingredient in Monsanto's herbicide Roundup. Yes, indeed. Drink yourself a nice healthy glass of Roundup. Mm-mm, good. <laughs> Un un unfortunately for many thousands of people who drink them every day, the most popular brands in the U.S. are among the most affected. Uh, the grassroots nonprofit Moms Across America has made a remarkable impact in the world of food activism, uh, helping to expose Monsanto companies uh, link to the American Pediatrics Association. Ah, oh, how nice. How nice that Monsanto is uh, associated with the American Pe Pediatrics Association. That's just wonderful. Apparently, they're no longer associated, but they were. Because um, the Pediatrics Association said, ah, you guys are toxic in more ways than one. <laughs> and keeping its members up to date on how to protect their families against the toxic chemicals that are in your food supply. Recently, the organization made waves with an announcement that caught the attention of the orange of orange juice drinkers everywhere. Samples of five major U.S. brands tested positive in the lab for glyphosate, phosate, however you want to say it. The chemical deemed... A probable human carcinogen? No, it's absolutely, positively, 100% a human carcinogen. It's also an animal carcinogen. And it also does other things to other critters. Uh, but the, even the, the disgusting World Health Organization uh, said so. <laughs> On March uh, 2015, uh, their, their research for cancer department... So it, it, was, it was found in amounts ranging from 4.43 parts per billion to 26.05 parts per billion by that group. Um, but, 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 uh, as noted in uh, this post from Moms Across America, there's a link there for that, America's uh, our research has shown that as little as 0 0.0 0.1 part per billion of glyphosate is capable of destroying beneficial gut bacteria. Repeated exposure is capable of weakening your immune system and potentially leading to a host of health problems on down the road. The post also included research that glyphosate may stimulate, exacerbate, accelerate breast cancer as it amounts as little as one part per trillion. Just so small you couldn't even measure it hardly. And that the American diet far exceeds government standards for most people, especially children, who are most at risk considering, considering they're still developing bodies. Uh, top five major brands that tested positive according to lab tests are Tropicana, Minute Maid, Stater Brothers. And that's only three. Where's the other ones? Tropicana, Minute Maid, Stater Brothers. Oh, they're down here. Uh, Signature Farms, which you, I guess you get at Vons. Kirkland that you get from Costco. Um, so, yeah, all those wonderful ones that you probably buy. 
Yeah, I don't buy any of those. All right. What that means for you, shoppers, consumers, taxpayers, citizens. <laughs> Considering that organic alternatives like Uncle Matt's are widely available, it's almost always good to pay a little extra to get pay extra to get less, less poison. Yes. Uh, and, and avoid the potential contamination of glyphosate and other harmful substances in the non-organic orange juice. In addition to glyphosate, numerous orange juice companies make and uh, companies numerous orange juices from various companies. I gotta edit this while I'm reading it for you. Uh, may contain, contain additives, including synthetic vitamins, in attempt to make up for those lost during the processing and pasteurization. Also, oh, uh, also uh, as well as so-called flavor packs that are likely to be chemically altered and are not required to be listed on the label. Uh, both Simply Orange from Coca-Cola and Tropicana have been sued over those chemically enhanced flavor packs. Yet another reason why health conscious consumers should think twice before buying them. And you know, it's actually better if you, if you could just buy some, some organic orange juice or oranges and make your own juice from those, you know, that, that, that's seriously, seriously a better way to go. Uh, just, just, you, you know, uh, just because. So while organic juice and organic oranges are available at many health food stores, the unfortunate fact is the vast majority of Americans still consume chemically laden orange juice from those companies that I already talked about, including unmarked brands at the grocery store that likely contain glyphosate. So if you're buying a, whatever, Kroger brand or something, uh, they also have toxic chemicals in them. To make matters more pressing, most chemically treated citrus growing in, uh, industry is currently dealing with a bacteria-based citrus greening disease that may one day lead to the introduction of GMO oranges, which could bring a whole host of other problems, health problems, environmental issues. In order to help pave the way for change, Moms Across America is urging concerned citizens to contact each of the five companies listed, as well as your grocery store chain knockoff brands, uh, in order to request that they switch to organic and regenerative agriculture-based methods in the future. Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. Yeah, it's a tall order at this current moment in our food system's history, but simply voicing your opinion can possibly hopefully make a difference down the line in helping change the system. Just say, I don't want no poison in my food. Thank you very much. Keep your poisons to yourselves and not in my foods. Anyway, for more information on how to contact these companies as well as additional info on glyphosate contamination and safety studies, uh, there's a link here to the full article uh, from moms across America. Uh, until then, do your best to steer clear of at least those five brands uh, and, and also, also the generics. Buy organic and spread the word to health conscious friends, y'all. Y'all here. Um, <laughs> who would prefer to keep poison out of their mouths and bellies and that of their families and uh, loved ones. Yes, quit drinking the rhythm. Three freaking poisons! Yes, it's damn sad, Beetle. I agree. Uh, yeah, it, they, right. They they put all kinds of crap. It's I don't even know how they get away calling it orange juice. The stuff they sell, it's just it's really nasty, really nasty. And, and you know, by, by the way, if you go to the grocery store and you find some organic juice and you're gonna buy that, and, and then you and they have two different kinds. They have regular and pulp free. You don't want the pulp free. I know a lot of people, oh, I don't want to drink that pulp. It's good for you. That's the good stuff. You want the pulp. <laughs> it doesn't talk about that here, but yes, indeed, you definitely want that pulp in, in your, in your, 
mouth, <laughs> in your belly, in your intestinal system. Yes, pulp is good for you. That's why it's in the orange in the first place. It wouldn't be in there. I mean, the oranges are designed properly. All right. <laughs> so, you're thinking about going out and getting yourself a nice used vehicle somewhere? Well, could be a problem with that. Say you go out and you say, hey, this car's only got 50 grand on it, 50,000 50, miles on it, and it's priced really well. I'm going to buy this, be this car. You better check some other things out because it's probably, or not probably, but may well be a lie. This here posted on WMC uh, Action News 5.com. Digital rollbacks. Millions of cars have false mileage numbers on the odometers. Yep, uh, this was uh, posted April 25th by Rachel de Pompia. Pompa. De Pompa. All right. There's a huge hidden danger on the roads, one that's illegal and potentially putting your family at risk. Rolled back odometers. Experts say vehicle odometers are easier than ever to roll back. Our research shows that there are now 1.6 million cars on the roads across the country that have an odometer rolled back, and that's costing you, consumers, millions of dollars. According to Chris Basso, who works with Carfax, the company that provides the vehicle history reports, in a demonstration with Carfax, an odometer on a 2006 Chevy Silverado with 230,323 miles was tampered with in less than 30 seconds. A technician with an inexpensive electronic device was able to erase nearly 100,000 miles of wear, tear, and history, leaving the Silverado with only 130,483 miles. There's a video here showing you how they did it, and it's like, uh, simple? Simple as hell. Uh, you're simply taking a device that hacks into the car's computer. You could take 100,000 miles off a car and artificially inflate the value of that car by thousands of dollars. And you're ripping people off. These rollbacks can be dangerous and very expensive for you. Uh, you've got older parts than you think the car has, that could break down sooner than you expect. If that car is being driven and those parts break down, not only are the passengers of that vehicle in possible danger, but so is everybody else out there on the road with them. Ah, the nightmare car. That's what Erica Baez called her BMW. Wish we never bought it. She got it a few months ago. It was supposed to be a fun weekend car for the Midlothian, Virginia mom. I got rid of a Mercedes that had a convertible. All, and all the kids loved that convertible. So I figured, let's go get one with less miles. And another one had about 200,000 miles. So she bought her uh, 2008 BMW at a dealer in Northern Virginia, just outside of D.C., for $9,500. The mileage on the odometer showed 136,507 miles. But Baez did not believe that mileage. She said her car had a laundry list of problems. There's a check engine light. There's a tire issue. At first, it had a hard time just turning on and off. The starter and the alternator were messed up. Three days after she got the car, she said a tire nearly fell off. A dealer handed her a $5,000 tab to fix all those problems. Then she saw an auto check report. There was a notification on the report of a potential rollback. Uh, the report showed the car with 44 miles, then with 44,000 miles a few years later. Then it showed the car with 218,000 miles. Now her car is currently missing 100,000 of those miles. <laughs> I would never think a digital odometer could actually have a rollback, she said. Uh, but she has learned quite the important lesson. Definitely make sure you get the auto check report and the Carfax report. I would never buy another used car without having both reports from both sides. Consumer attorney John Gale is helping Baez fight to make this things right. 
it's really scary. Unless you, as a buyer of the car, are suspicious or careful, you're never going to know. Unfortunately, he's seen situations like this before. If someone sold that vehicle with rolled back odometer to the dealer, and even if the dealer did not know, you can go after the person up the line for three times the actual damages of ten thousand uh, dollars, or to up to ten thousand dollars, and all the legal fees. Rolling back the odometer is a federal crime. We simply have to show that the person up the line or that the dealer was aware of this odometer, uh, this mileage issue, and did not disclose it or misrepresented it. Investigative TV found several cars for sale at several different dealers with potential odometer rollbacks. To confirm a suspected odometer rollback in Richmond, Virginia, an undercover producer went to a used car lot and talked to a salesperson about a 2004, uh, 2004 Ford Explorer. Uh, when the producer asked about the year of the SUV, indeed being 2004, the salesperson, who Investigative TV will not name because he did nothing wrong, responded, Yes, sir. So really, for 15 years old, it's pretty good miles. Well below the average, anyway. Uh, the salesperson told the producer several times the miles were guaranteed. It was a selling point. I mean, 200,000 miles is it's in pretty good shape. Like a very good shape, even, the salesperson said. The producer took several photos, including, including of the uh, vehicle identification number. The salesperson then gave uh, the producer an auto check report that clearly showed the odometer problems on the vehicle. But there was also no odometer readings reported at all between 2005 and 2017. However, a Carfax report clearly showed what was missing. The Ford Explorer had 268,000 miles in 2014 and 290,000 in 2015. The miles dropped by nearly 100,000 in October of 2016 before the dealer bought it six months later. <laughs> I tell you, man, people are just scumbags. They're just thieves. They, they, they don't care. They're, they're, they're con men. They don't care. They'll rip your ass off any chance they get. Now, I know if you're going to go and buy a used car, you're probably kind of tight on money in the first place. And these, these reports aren't free. You got to pay for a car fax. You got you, you to gotta pay for that. Uh, what's that other report? Uh, well, you got to pay for these things. So you're going to be shelling out some money, possibly never even buying a car, the car. Oh, your dad, uh, Beetle says his dad used to roll back car, car miles. I, I mean, he probably did it with a drill. Yeah, that, that's the old way. Uh, but, but these, uh, you can't do that with the new ones. <laughs> that, that's just horrible, horrible thing to do. Uh, I, I, you should have smacked him upside the head. For, for ripping people off or wanting to rip people off. You know, that I, I just, it's, that's just pure thievery. I, I, I don't know how people get away with that. Mm. Or I should say, I don't know how people sleep at night after doing that because they get away with it very easily. You know, all you got to do is do it and then tell people that's what they were. <laughs> Have I talked about this article? No, probably not this one. But I've talked about other articles of things going on at airports where uh, more reasons you don't want to fly, more reasons you don't ever want to be uh, in contact with the TSA. Uh, and, and But anyway, this is an older article from April 30th here on the AP, APnews.com. U.S. searches of phones, laptops, at airports rising, a lawsuit says. United States government searches of travelers' cell phones and laptops at airports and border crossings nearly quadrupled since 2015 and were being done for reasons well beyond Customs and Immigration Enforcement, according to papers filed Tuesday in a federal lawsuit that claims scouring the electronic devices without a warrant is unconstitutional. Yeah, I know I've covered this article before. 
I don't know how it was still in my list, unless I also picked it up from another site that, that was carrying it. Uh, either way, just go on a little bit here. Uh, the government has vigorously defended the searches, which rose to 33,295 in fiscal 2018, as a critical tool to protect America. Yes, I did say easily. <laughs> But the new filed documents claim the scope of the warrantless searches has expanded to assist in enforcement of, enforcement of tax, bankruptcy, environmental and consumer protection laws, gather intelligence, and advance criminal investigations. Agents with the U.S. Customs and Border Protection and the U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement, ICE, uh, consider requests from every other government agency in determining whether to search travelers' electronics devices, court papers said. How do I keep losing my spot here? Oh, they added that agents are searching the electronic devices of not only targeted targeted individuals, but their associates, their friends, their relatives. Let me do a little sidebar here. I know I'm in the middle of this thing here talking about what they're doing to you, all the terrible things they're doing to you at these various places where they stick your big, their big nose into your, uh, your business. A lot of people out there voluntarily offer up their DNA to sites like uh, genealogy, what is it called? The genealogy sites? 23 and Me is one, and there's a, I forget the name of the other one. Anyway, you voluntarily send your DNA up to these places. Those places then share that information with various government agencies. Any government agency that requests that data will get that information. But you say, well, hell, I would never do that. I'm not going to offer up my DNA, the blueprint of, of my humanly makeup. I would never do that. Well, here's the thing. You don't have to. But let's say you have a sibling or a parent or a uncle or an aunt or a grandparent that is wanting to use one of these genealogy sites. They send their information up there. Well, their DNA can be used to track you down or anybody within the family because of the familial DNA matches. <laughs> so if you are part of a family that may do this, that may want to track down and find out if they're 194th Cherokee. What was that, what was that woman? 1994th Cherokee. <laughs> They can use that DNA and track down all of her relatives, uh, anybody that they want to try and match. See, Vinny, he didn't do it, but his brother did, his niece did. So I'm sure they had your DNA anyway, Vinny, because, you know, just, yeah, it just goes to show, goes to follow. <laughs> so anyway, first off, don't ever do it because what, what a... Well, what do you think you're benefiting from knowing that somewhere back in history you may have once had a, a Hawaiian relative? <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so I just, had to, I just had to sidebar there as I'm going through this TSA thing. Uh, back to the article here. The new information about searches was included in an emotion uh, the Electronic Frontier, EFF, and the ACLU filed Tuesday in U.S. District Courts of Massachusetts. The evidence ha we have presented to the court shows that the scope of ICE and CBP uh, border searches is wholly unconstitutional and extremely broad. ICE and CBP policies and practices allow unfettered, warrantless searches of travelers, uh, digital devices, and empowers officers to dodge the Fourth Amendment when rifling through the highly personal information 
contained on laptops, phones, tablets, what what have you, the Department of Homeland Security did not respond, imagine that, to a request for comment. Both ICE and CBP said they did not comment on pending litigation. When the suit was filed against the government back in 2017, DHS officials said U.S. citizens and everyone else are subject to examination in search by custom officials unless exempted by diplomatic status. That's also something you should know, which they're not uh, talking about here, but when you buy a ticket from an airline, from a commercial airline, you are agreeing to let them do whatever the hell they want to you and your stuff. You don't have to believe me. Just look it up on your tickets. It'll tell you right on there. The department has contended that no court has concluded that border searches of electronic devices require a warrant. Searches, some random, have uncovered evidence of human traffic, terrorism, child pornography, visa fraud, export control breaches, and intellectual pro- <laughs> intellectual property rights. Uh, they gotta slip that shit in there, huh? Yeah, right, right between uh, or right after terrorism and child pornography, they throw in this freaking copyright bullshit. Um, <laughs> As if, as if you have a, a song on an MP3 player that you didn't actually pay for. You're a child pornography and ter- human trafficking terrorist. <laughs> oh my God. Uh, the original case was filed on behalf of 10 American citizens and a lawful resident from uh, seven states, uh, including two journalists and a NASA engineer and a former Air Force captain who alleges the searches violated their constitutional rights. Of course, we all know that the Constitution means nothing to them. It should mean nothing to you. It should never have meant anything to you, although at one time it was very important to me. I believed it. I thought it was the document that could save my life from them until I realized they just don't give a crap about the Constitution. Every, you look through the, the, the main body of the Constitution and they violate the, every part of that every day. You look through the, the, the Bill of Rights. <laughs> no, not a single one of those rights has not been uh, just totally trampled across. Do I have any good news? Uh, I do. The next story is good news. Let me get to the next story because we all know about all this crap already. The next story is great news. And I think you should follow or, you know, take it take it to heart. And may, maybe use what they're telling you here in this next article to benefit your life. This is posted on happymag.tv. Have a nice trip. Shrooms have been confirmed as the world's safest recreational drug. Woohoo! Shroom it up, baby! <laughs> uh, ahead of Happy Bag Issue 10, our inaugural drug issue, we're throwing our voice into building a uh, more drug aware world. Uh, time to get a wrist, time to get wrist deep in a couple of cow patties because magic mushrooms are officially your safest recreational drug. And let me tell you, they are fun. According to real life scientists, real life scientists, ooh, not those fake robotic scientists, these, these are real life scientists. This data comes from a recent global drug survey and amongst the great news for shroom enthusiasts, there was a few other tidbits of information that you psychonauts, psychonauts may be into. According to the world's largest annual drug survey, psilocybin mushrooms are the least dangerous recreational drug drug that we are all taking. The Global Drug Survey pulled the the experiences over over 120,000 participants from over 50 countries in 2016. A group of 28,000 in that sample had used magic mushrooms. Of all the substances surveyed, 
Mushrooms showed the lowest percentage of users who had to seek emergency medical treatment on their trips. Only 0.2% of users, male and female, who had tripped on shrooms reported having to undergo, undergo emergency treatment. And they were just freaking out. There's really, I mean, there was nothing... There's nothing that the shrooms are going to do to you. Uh, but people do sometimes freak out. But only 0.2%. This is compared to a global average of 4.8% for meth users. Well, that stuff can kill you. Um, 3.2% of synthetic weed smokers. That stuff can kill you too. And 1.3% of boozers. Yes, alcohol will definitely kill you. What stands out here, well, not definitely, but it is a much higher, uh, a lot of people die from alcohol, um, whether just from drinking way, way too much of it or doing stupid shit while they're on it. Anyway, uh, what stands out here to me is that aside from the meth and synthetic cannabis, which were widely known to be dangerous, most drugs sit around the 1% mark, all as dangerous as each other. Yet only one of them is legal to consume on a global scale. Huh. Ahead of the... Uh, uh, <laughs> oh, they already said, I already said that part. Okay, so that, that, that's really all it's got to say about that. But yeah, shrooms, man. Shroom it up, babies. <laughs> I don't know. I would have no idea where to get any shrooms these days. But uh, yeah, a lo lovely, a lovely, a lovely time can be had. When you are a shrooming. A lovely, lovely, lovely time. What time is it here? 51. Okay. All right. You using a browser to uh, browse the internet? Of course you are. You're on the computer. You're listening to me. Some of you, most of y'all are tuned in via a browser. Uh, some of you are not. There's a couple of VLC users, a real player user. Uh, others, other other users, I, I you know, but most of the people... Just tune in through rlmradio.xyz or reallibertymedia.com uh, because, you know, the, the web player works great. I, I designed it myself. <laughs> so anyway, this article going all the way back to October uh, 25th of 2018, which is not really all that, all that far back, but, you know, eight, nine months, something like that. Um, from makeuseof.com, make use of. By Dan Price. Four free anonymous web browsers that are completely private. Because, you know, it's good to be private. It's good to be anonymous. You don't want, you don't, you don't want your ISPs uh, knowing where you're going. You don't want the government knowing what you're doing and looking at what you're doing your searches on. Because uh, they can and will use them against you if they should so desire at some point. Private information is big business, and everyone is trying to watch you. The Secret Services, government, Microsoft, cyber criminals, uh, not to mention uh, Google and Apple and all them, and your creepy neighbor from across the street all want to know what you're doing all the time. While it's almost impossible to remove yourself from the global grid completely, there are some steps you can take to reduce your information footprint. The best place to start is with your browser. It is your main portal to the web, so using a more secure option will make a huge difference to your privacy. Simply enabling private browsing in your current browser is not enough. Your new browser to uh, you need a new browser to achieve true anonymous browsing. Eh, you, you could use a VPN. VPN works great, but just still on top with included with that VPN. Also, and it's got to be a good VPN. You don't want a VPN that that keeps logs because boy, that does you no good whatsoever. Anyway, <laughs> well, it, it can help you out in a few little things, but as far as privacy, it doesn't help you out. <laughs> anyway, the Tor browser, uh, which is good for Mac, Windows, and Linux. Uh, the Tor network has a simple goal, anonymous communication. It's the best private web browser available. And, you know, it's not all that user-friendly. But it is apparently the best browser for using the dark web. 
Um, and they, they go into a lot of details on each of the browsers here, but I'm not going to give you all the details. Then there's one called Epic Browser, which is available on Windows and Mac, not on Linux, which is a little disconcerting to me. Anyway, Epic Browser does not use a specialized Onion network, but it does immediately disable lots of the most common ways your privacy is compromised while you're surfing the web. For example, it does not save your history. There's no DNS prefetching. It doesn't allow third-party cookies. There's no web or DNS caches. Of course, you could turn all that stuff. You can set all those settings in your in your uh, Mozilla or or Chrome-based browsers as well. If you actually dig into the settings, which I know most people don't, want, but once you install a browser, uh, you should get in there into the settings and dig through it. And make sure everything is set. Um, to protect your privacy as best as possible. So when you close your session, the browser automatically deletes any associated databases, preferences, pepper data, and cookies from Flash and Silverlight. Although I think Silverlight's pretty much finished and as well as Flash. Um, then there's SRWare Iron. It's, if you're a Google Chrome user, SRWare Iron will be familiar. It's based on the open source Chromium project so a lot of the on-screen visuals look very similar. The difference between Chrome and SRWare Iron is data protection. Experts have criticized Chrome for its reliance on a unique user ID. Every time you start a session, Google knows who you are. They want you. They want to go in there and track your data. SRWare strips out the usage of, a, of that ID along with the other private, uh, Chrome privacy concerns, such as search suggestions. Then there's Komodo uh, Dra Dragon Browser, available also on Windows and Mac and not Linux. Um, Komodo does not come close to the Tor browser, but does have some built-in tools that will make browsing the web a safer experience. So there you have it, and uh, you may want to check into some of those um, and, and also, absolutely, regardless of what browser you're using, uh, check out your, your privacy and security settings uh, and definitely hook up with a VPN. If you need a VPN, I recommend Private Internet Access, which if you go to reallibertymedia.com, you'll see a link there on the side for Private Internet Access. And if you click on that, a few dollars will head our way. So uh, that would be highly appreciated if you're going to actually shell out the bucks for a VPN. It's not that much. Uh, and, it's, and it's a great thing to have. So that's also good news, in case you were wondering more good news. This last article, I'm not going to say too much about it. We all know about it. And it's not good news. It's horrible news. But it is the, thing, the, way, it went, the way it is. This article from the Free Thought Project uh, on uh, May 12th, Cops sexually abuse women and children at an alarming rate, and nobody's talking about it. Sexual predation by police officers happens far more often than people in the business are willing to admit. How could this be happening right under our noses? Because uh, people think cops are a good thing. They trust cops. Don't, don't, don't trust those guys. Ah, some of you do. I don't want to mention your names, but I know some of you that do. That's what readers wanted to know after this guy's column went viral uh, about the extent at which young children are being bought and sold for sex in America. Where are these police when these children, some as young as nine years old, are being raped repeatedly? For that matter, where is the Trumpster in his administration? What's he doing about the fact that adults purchase children for sex at least 2.5 million times a year in suburbs, cities, and towns across the good old U.S. of A.? I'll tell you what the government's doing. Nothing, or little to it anyway. For while American children are being menaced by sexual predators, the Trump administration is, and its congressional cohorts continue to wage endless wars, run up the national, national debt, and distract the populace with vitriol and kabuki po political theater. 
The cops are no better. In many, too many instances, the cops are worse. Indeed, while there are certainly many good cops, at least according to this guy, in this country, and I disagree because if they were good cops, they would be fired immediately, or they would quit, one of the two. You can't be a good person <laughs> and be a cop because you have to sit there and watch others do horrible things without saying anything. You can't be a good cop. Anyway, and I've had the honor of working with a number of them, this guy, not me, obviously. And bad cops have become symptomatic of a criminal justice system that is deeply rotten through and through. We can no longer count on police to save us, you never could, from the worst in our society. In many cases, rather than, I mean, let's say the worst in society are coming after you. Yeah, you get on the phone and call, call 911, you're dead long before they get there. Anyway, in many cases, rather than being part of the solution, America's police forces riddled with corruption, brutality, sexual misconduct, and drug abuse have largely become part of the problem. All right, I'm out of time here, so I'm just going to give you a link to this article. All these links will be in the post-show blog, by the way, for you. So uh, look over there for that. Yeah, oh, yeah, I'm over my time already. I didn't even realize it. Okay. Um, anyway, I'll be back again next week with uh, another episode of the Grim Leftovers show. And um, but, 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 but Flash will be on tomorrow. Flash and Vinny, I do believe. Vinny's still with us before his summer break. So um, should be Flash and Vinny in a perfect world tomorrow. Grammy's on Wednesday and Friday at 7 p.m. Eastern. Uh, check the schedule on reallibertymedia.com for all the rest of the shows. Great shows here on Real Liberty Media, rlmradio.xyz. Thank you all for tuning in. It's been a fun time. Talk to you all later. Peace.